Ed uh, Feigenbaum says that he remembers that just after Christmas vacation in 1955, or mm -hmm. 56 by that time, uh, you came into your mathematical modeling class and you said, over Christmas, Alan Newell and I invented a thinking machine. Did I say that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and he said all the, all the students just sort of sat in stunned silence and they didn't really understand what you meant. They yeah. knew what you meant by machine and they thought they knew what you meant by thinking, but the two words just didn't go together. Anyway, you, you also said that um, after that work was done, it was all downhill from, from there in, in the south. Well, uh, we had the sort of... We, we knew it could be done. We still didn't have a running program on the computer, but we sort of knew how to organize it. And we had uh, we had succeeded in hand simulating the uh, the Principia proofs. So, in in that sense, downhill there was, was a certain large amount of work to be done thereafter. Well, you you're probably I'm sure familiar with Thomas Kuhn's notion of a paradigm. Yeah. Uh, would you say that this was a paradigm? Maybe I, I will read you his formal definition. Yeah. Long. Well, I, I know I don't remember the formal definition, but I know his views pretty well. Uh, yeah, I think we thought we had a a paradigm, and that it was noticeably different from what was around before. Lots of people have talked about about have had reductionist theories of human behavior, primarily physiological theories up to that time. Um, but I guess we, th I guess we understood that this was a new and different reduction. Well, uh, the kind of information processing theory we produced uh, does not provide you with a physiological theory of how the human being operates. That's still another layer below. Physiologists haven't done their work yet. Um, but this showed that these human uh, performances could be produced by a system having nothing in its innards except a certain speci very highly specified set of information processes uh, organized in such a way that they could be simulated on a computer. My uh, there are several analogies you can have here. My favorite one is the, the 19th century chemistry analogy. Uh, 19th century chemistry was able to take behavior of sticky stuff in test tubes and reduce it to the combining and recombining of some hypothetical entities called molecules and atoms. There were no, no physical reality of those things uh, in the sense of any direct ways of observing them. That had to be supplied in the 20th century, mostly by physics. And likewise, I think all of us believe that uh, ultimately one wants a physiological uh, theory of, of human thinking, but instead of trying to go from the from the complex behavior in one jump down to neurons, uh, here was a reduction to some uh, intermediate, an intermediate level of processes that was obviously mechanizable, because we mechanized it, uh, whether it's as obvious that it's in turn reducible to physiology, that's, as I say, that's the physiologist's problem, which they haven't quite given us the answer to yet. But there were people doing nerve nets, especially the uh, at that time the Rochester uh, Galenter project at, at IBM, uh, which was based in turn on the McCullough Pitts ideas that we talked about last time. Um, very schematic neurons, but nevertheless trying to do it at that level. But getting up to behaviors which were far less complex than problems, human problem solving behaviors. All they were trying to do was to get a nerve net to organize anyhow, which was important to do. I don't mean to denigrate it, but but uh, see, we were trying to go from A to B, and they were trying to go from Z to Y, and there's still a lot of things in between B and Y. Um, I why has the Carnegie Group concentrated almost entirely on human psychology? I mean, as distinct from artificial intelligence and other aspects. I think two reasons. One, that's where we came in. The original motivations, certainly for me and I think for Al, 
uh, arose out of our attempts to understand human behavior in organizations. And uh, so our enterprise was a psychological one from the beginning. Second reason, uh, because it seemed to us, now let me speak for myself for the moment, another part of my life I was very much involved in operations research and all those good things, which in a sense are, if you like, artificial intelligence, use of, of powerful mathematics and computing techniques to do things that people don't, don't do so well, if you like. Uh, and I saw human beings able to solve a lot of kinds of problems that we hadn't reduced to OR formulations uh, or to the formulations of economic theory. And so starting with the notions that I had out of that part of my life and out of my organization theory of bounded rationality, it seemed to me that there were a lot of sly tricks that people had which we were going to have to learn about and borrow and apply if we were to have effective artificial intelligence. And it was a two-way street. It wasn't just artificial intelligence contributing to psychology. It was ideas coming out of psychology, which we needed if we were ever to have effective artificial intelligence. And I think the first working example of that was, uh, uh, was the whole idea of uh, an associ associational memory and the list structure, the list processing languages. Now, the ideas for those came from many sources. And Al will have one version of that. But one important source of ideas for the list processing languages was what psychologists knew about uh, associational memory. And I think I mentioned last time that one of the things I was doing, uh, certainly by the spring of, in the winter again, in the spring of 55, 56, was sort of scratching through the psychological literature to see what I could find that was relevant. And uh, in, in many ways, the, the key, key idea for EPAM came out of a 1940 article of Eleanor Gibson's that we dug up during that time. In other words, what you're saying is that the notion of list processing in memory preceded the notion of list processing in languages. In, uh, yeah. Uh, that, in a way, list processing, in, in some of its aspects, list processing develops out, the idea, out of the idea of an associational memory, which goes back at least to Aristotle, as applied to human memory. I'm sorry, did you interrupt? No, no. Have, no, I, I said all... I meant to about that. But the general idea of the use of heuristics, which has been very strong in our group, uh, again comes basically out of the conviction that uh, heuristics, that's a very vague term, but it was intended to be vague. It was intended to be as sort of an umbrella term for, as I say, the whole set of sly tricks which humans use in lieu of computing power. And we wanted to know what they were. Because if you look at the early, you know, the early chess playing proposals, not Shannon so much, but the people who actually started programming like the people down at Los Alamos. Oh, well, their idea was, here we got this big, fast machi machine. We're going to search the net. Well, they are going to search the net. And our idea was, you know, how do people do it? What can we learn from that? And that's continued to be, both on the psychological side of our lives here and also on the AI side, continue to be um, a... Uh, source of ideas for uh, AI devices. Good. Looking at the psychological yeah. literature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and running our experiments and trying to develop a psychological theory to go with the go with the AI part of it. How did you get started on EPAM? Um, the first thing I have in my file is a memo of about February 56. Um, we can dig it up sometime and check the date, but it's something like that, uh, which I wrote my typewriter over in GSIA on a very snowy Sunday uh, afternoon down here. Um, and it, uh, as I say, came out of thinking about an article of Eleanor Gibson's in which she was trying to clear up some of the... Uh, uh, some problems about verbal learning. I forget at the moment exactly the point of her of her paper. It's a fairly, it was even then a fairly well-known known paper. And uh, somehow or other that ticked some vague ideas of, uh, uh, well, why couldn't we uh, uh, build a memory that would operate like this, would learn like this, what would be involved, the notion of the letter features and so on. And Ed was around, a graduate student, I guess about ready to take on the thesis subject, and we talked about it a little bit, and then we developed it, and by summer, 
Um, Ed can probably give you more dates on this one than I, since he was spending most of his life on it. By summer, we had a pretty clearly worked out idea of how an EPAM net should work. I remember we were out at the summer seminar in 56, and I remember walking on the beach one noon with Ed at Rand, talking about this memory structure and how many nodes it would have to have. Um, so I know we had that idea. Well, we had that idea even before the summer, because um, uh, Ed, I'm, I think, gave a presentation of it to the summer seminar. At Rand. At Rand, yeah. I, it wasn't programmed then, but but uh, but it the first the first glimmer of the first idea of trying something like this um, must have been February or March '56. Uh, but that that would be in conjunction with the work that you were then doing on the logic theorists. Because yeah, it worked. Ra- you see, after after that Christmas holiday, when we knew that we knew the heuristics for doing it, we knew the heuristics the program had to have. Then the whole emphasis switched to getting the programming language designed and running. Now, uh, if I recall right, Al took his prelims just around that Christmas time, um, and so in terms of the dog work, uh, I was probably doing the bulk of that uh, before the end of the year. And then as the emphasis shifted to the programming languages, uh, then Al took over the main leadership on the task. Uh, and that was the main thing that was occupying us uh, all through uh, the late winter and spring, 56, up to the Dartmouth con- conference. And um, I don't remember whether we were doing anything on chess then or not. I think that was on a back burner. Um, we had that in mind as sort of the second push. And it was almost all on the logic theorist. Well, what I was doing during that time mostly, I don't know what mostly, one of the things I was doing during that time was, in fact, scanning the psychological literature. The EPAM project came up, and that sort of began then as a separate activity, well, semi-separate activity, but a, a definable activity uh, primarily between Ed and me, uh, which went on during that, that spring. And um, meanwhile, uh, we're going very hot and heavy on implementing uh, the logic theorist, which meant the writing of that first article, well, a speech that Al gave in March down in Washington, and then the first, the article for the September I Triple E, um, and Al working with, with Cliff on the actual uh, language that was going to run on the machine, which came after that first the language in the first article, the first logic theory article, the IEEE, was never one that was implemented. It was a conceptual language. But then to get it on Johnny Act, Al and, and Cliff mostly mostly worked that out um, on the basis of the general ideas in that first article. Um, and that's where the available space li- list got invented, which made the... Uh, that was the key to implementing a list processing language done today with garbage collectors, but we did it with an available space list. And uh, that was when Al was in Pittsburgh, but communicating almost daily with Cliff, both on the phone and uh, and with long letters which have been preserved. Al's got that, I know, and I have copies of those from that period. So we have lots of documentation. So you went up to the Dartmouth conference with the first... I think you said last time the first hand simulation of the logic piece. No, I think the first, uh, so actually the first printout. first printout, yeah. Right. Right. yeah. And um, I understand from others who were there that you really made a big splash because they were all sort of talking about it in a theoretical way and here you two came on the scene with the real thing. Yeah, we, we were one up, <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> yeah. What was your impression of that conference? I know, uh, I understand that you and Al particularly resisted the whole notion, the whole idea of calling the field artificial intelligence. We didn't like the name at all. We had uh, we had talked a lot about labels, and the one we had settled on, as a matter of fact, I, one of the things I encountered as I was looking for things that you will later want to delve through was a sheet of paper which has a long list of terms down the side, complex information processing and you know all the rest. Uh, I remember that also. I think that was a day we were sitting over in the office. We had these all on the blackboard, and we're trying to decide what we were going to use for what. So we had settled on the on complex information processing 
as the phrase we were going to going to use. Um, what and some of the other candidates do? Remember? Well, I'd have to see if I can find the. Uh, oh, that's okay. uh, dig it out. It's in that. But maybe one day we can look at them and see what yeah. you eliminated. You want to do that now? We can. Sure. I'll have to unhook myself, I guess. We got busy writing immediately after that Christmas vacation because here's a uh, a draft of a paper that never appeared in this form called Mechanisms of Human and notice it's on human problem solving on January fifty six. And here's the selective search stuff. And here we're going to talk about computers because we just assumed or I assumed that nobody knew anything about them. And here's the symbolic logic. So this is sort of a a pre draft of the uh, of the September 66 paper. Um, and here is, this is a, just a little memo to ourselves that came out of the reading in psychology, trying to get some terms straight. What do we want to mean by learning? Um, learning, fixation, discovery, discrimination, learning in the problem solving machine, etc. Um, here is one of the early, oh, this may be part of the uh, stimulus for, for uh, EPAM. Uh, Selfridge loved to put this uh, conundrum up. Uh, how do you know that's an H and that's an A? That's an H and that's an A. You've probably seen that in some of your yes, stuff. And so on February 1st, 56, uh, there's a uh, memorandum, which I can't really understand to myself. These are kind of notes I keep. Uh, difference between one trial and many trial learning, span of immediate recall, uh, cues, initial period, build up black, white distinction, etc. So it was this kind of thing that began to lead to the EPAM. Uh, write and store a description of a stimulus, construct a response. That's a memo that apparently didn't have an exact date on it. And here, yeah, this was the Sunday afternoon. I was, I was reading uh, Zenison at the time and uh, working on my Greek. And on the 18th of February, uh, it got named, in fact. I didn't realize we had the name then, yeah. It really was named after a Parmenandus usage. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, didn't you know that? <laughs> no, I thought it was just the elementary procedure. <laughs> well, I don't know which of these came first, but... Um, and here is description association learning file. Inferences from human memorizing perception. This is stuff distilled out of the literature. Uh, EPAM and Gibson's theory of verbal learning. Psych review, volume 49, etc. That's the Gibson article. And... This apparently all got typed out that afternoon. Most of the latter part of it is mostly notes on the Gibson paper. Yeah. And also a paper, uh, a chapter in Stephen's handbook, uh, worrying about time for trial, etc. I didn't realize it was so long. Oh, but I do remember doing this. What was I trying to do? I was free associating. I guess I was worrying about uh, the structure of the long-term memory. Uh, there's Xenophon, you see. He really is there. Yeah. The typewriter was my analyst, you see. <laughs> oh, I was trying to probably time finger motions. Who knows? You know, how fast can you type up? <laughs> uh, and here's some more stuff on probably, oh, this is a, a based probably on a famous article by the other Gibson, uh, J uh, Jackie's husband, uh, Jimmy Gibson, on set. I was trying to get the different meanings of it. Well, it was that I really wanted to show you, I think. Was there another item? Now, apparently we had been approached on that before March because we were already sending them a memorandum then. Did you find out any more of how we got approached? No, definitely not. I didn't get to Boston this weekend, as it turned out. Oh, I see. I see. Okay, well, let's just... Un unless you want to see what else we can turn up here. Oh, this is fascinating. Yeah. Do you always keep this, this good uh, documentation? No, I have better documentation for this period. Than Most of the rest is sort of loose. Uh, you see there are some... 
all of those boxes underneath are pieces of my life. But this particular period, I just guess I knew that I wanted to remember about it. Okay. Did you have a sense that you were doing something very special? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yep. No doubt. Um, I mean, one always has a, a good feeling about good research, but there are better feelings about better research. Yeah. No. Um, seemed obvious. <laughs> well, during the uh, during the uh, spring, we were trying to you know push this out and elaborate a little bit. And these are just some thinking alouds, worrying about what plans were, relation between plans and hierarchies. Hierarchies of programs already stored. Uh, I think these are some notes I made when I was up in Michigan for a weekend and some damn conference or other and jotted them down. There's another memorandum by April, and I'm sure Ed was much involved in this by, by April on Pam Nandis. Um, some quaint language at perception and a large capacity file computer, whatever that is, temporary storage. Low capacity series computer, for taking information from temporary perception, permanently storing it, and so on. Here are the programs we were going to need. What is reinforcement? Uh, worrying about attention as a function in all this whole thing. Again, going back to the psychological literature. All that. And, oh, here was presumably an early memorandum. We must have been sweating about the question of how could such a program get generated? Uh, could we, by looking at proofs that we achieved and going back and analyzing them, diagnose and so on? Um, then here's a more ambitious little project uh, coming out of the uh, Systems Research Laboratory out of RAN. Could we duplicate a Bales con conference on machine? You know, Fried Bales' uh, uh, work on, on coding what goes on in a human conference. And we had a protocol. Take the Colonel Allen transcript. That was a protocol we have, which, in fact, later on I did analyze to some extent. Um, in fact, this is sort of the, the scheme that probably would almost have worked. Um, now, Alan and I date the beginning of the book at different dates. Uh, but I thought we were working, writing a book already in April 56, because here's something called Chapter 5, <laughs> Draft 1. Um, and it's got in it a fair amount of what came out in the second, uh, at least in the outline of it, came out in the second uh, explorations with a problem-solving mm -hmm. program. Uh, the statistics of problem solving and so forth. And the planning idea is already in there. There's some notes in here somewhere or in one of the other notebooks that show that uh, the idea of GPS planning, not GPS planning, but the idea of, of planning by going up to an abstract space was something we were already fooling with in the spring of 56. Um, here we are worrying about can we add a learning program to this? Oh, this is the one I did up at Michigan. They had peacocks at the place. It was one of these, one of these houses that the university acquires from some rich character. They put up a little conference there. Oh, there were peacocks around the yard. And I remember trying to ponder this while I was admiring the peacocks. Uh, no. Work proofs backwards, providing the just basis for judging similar and different, and so on. So we need to go into the content of it. Here's the second draft of same. There's an outline. Now this outline, I don't know, this later got cannibalized. Um, this is an illustration of sort of some of the ideas that came out of the, the earlier stuff that we'd done in organization context. Uh, the notion of using aspiration level and aspiration level uh, adjustment as a, one of the mechanisms for guiding a search and for learning. Um, the empty world hypothesis is something that had come out of the earlier, um, some of the earlier attempts to, well, like those two chapters of mine in Models of Man uh, on uh, selective search through, through spaces mm -hmm. as a model of human behavior. Um, that, that kind of language later dropped out, but 
sort of suggests the, the ties between this and what had gone on earlier. Um, attempts to define what problem solving is as formally as possible. This was probably, oh, this was just a piece I did one night when I was feeling angry about Talcott Parsons, I guess. About what? Talcott Parsons. Oh. <laughs> uh, then... Why did you get mad at Talcott Parsons? Oh, such a ball of fluff. You know, there's all this... I hope you censored this tape. There's all this talk about general theories of this and that, and he didn't know what a theory was. Uh, then we were trying to see whether we could get some formalization on the size of the problem space and see if we could do any mathematics on it, and most of us never got anywhere. But we tried it anyway. Um, this, is, this is where the idea of the set representation and the search representation of the problem, which we discuss, where that distinction we make later on comes from. Um, Oh, a little memo on what the nature of functional analysis is. Um, a lot of these themes were there right from the beginning. We just never had any chance to do anything about it. The first thing ever published on that subject was the uh, piece that uh, Al did with um, uh, Husey, uh, just a piece published about two or three years ago on functional analysis. Um, oh, one of the graduate students who got a, uh, a degree with Al. Ah, ah, ah. He's out on the West Coast now. Well, up here in the present place. Um, but these themes were sort of bubbling around from very early on. What a, what a spring that must have been. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did yeah. you sleep at all? I slept very well, probably better than I do now. <laughs> uh, oh, here in April, we were wondering whether we couldn't apply this to do uh, differentiation. Never, you know, never got it reduced. Here we were worrying about what the difference is between a... Uh, Algorithm and a heuristic, because we already wanted to use that term, which we got from uh, Polya. Uh-huh. Uh, you know that Al took undergraduate courses yes. from Polya. Uh, and here are all sorts of ter- uh, terms that we were trying out. Um, this seems to be uh, trying to find some other task environments that we could transfer to easily. Uh, functional calculus, elementary number theory, plane geometry, Combinatorics. We'd done, of course, in the fall a little bit of preliminary work on geometry, but hadn't gotten very far. Design of switching circuits with memory. I don't know what that's all about. I think these were just possible, possible uh, directions to go. Uh, I must have been playing the name game with somebody. Gleason is a mathematician at Harvard. Milner, you know who Milner is. I don't know who Christine Chris is. I once. I may have mentioned this to you. I once found it, reached in my pocket where I keep little scraps of paper, and I drew out a piece of paper, and on it it said, in my handwriting, mind you, Andreas Papandreou wants to see you. And as far as I know, I'd never heard that name before in my life. This is the Andy Papandreou, who's now back in Greece. He was a young mathematical economist. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we met shortly thereafter. That's when I was around the Carl's Commission. <laughs> I never found out how that piece of paper got there. Well, as a man who is very skeptical about the mystical side of life, <laughs> I'd like an explanation. Well, when I think of one, I'll tell you. Uh, now, July 8th, 56, that's almost Dartmouth, isn't it? Yeah. This may have been written up there. Right. Some learning, pro- again, some projects. Could we do some learning? Um, that means not our learning, but could we put learning into the program? Right. Um, and self-program- self-programming was the ter- translation of learning, of course. Uh, so we were talking about automatic programming. We didn't know how to do it. Um, do you know what the dates of that conference were? Well, apparently it ran... It was fairly late, wasn't it? Weeks. Oh, well, we were only up there about two weeks. Right. Most people came. That and yeah. Small Did it run that long? Um, yeah. In fact, some people remember it as running all summer. But I, I see. Don't think that was true. Yeah. We must have been up there toward the end because we were up there and then we came back to the uh, MIT conference. Uh huh. The MIT conference. That's not the same thing as the IEEE conference. Yeah. That was at MIT. Right. I see. I see. 
Yeah, it was in that uh, Crestio Auditorium there. Uh-huh. Yeah, like yeah, uh, Marvin told me that you all talked about what you'd done. So these July ones were probably before we went up. Uh, here I must have been reading Brunner. Oh, probably the uh, the Brunner uh, Goodnow and Austin book came out just then. That that summer it came out that year I know. So I was reading that and taking notes uh, from that. Do you take notes generally? When you read? Uh, a couple of books a year, and oh. I really want to understand them, or I I heavily mark them up. But I only read seriously a couple of books a year, maybe. And, and I find a book that's obviously series. important. Oh, yeah, really taking them apart and finding out what makes them tick. Um, well, here's the safe example, which I usually that probably came out of reading Ashby, actually, whether consciously or not. You were starting to say last time that when Ashby's book came out, that had quite an influence on you. Yeah. Um, that was a book, again, which I sat down and really read and read right away. Minsky told me he had the same uh, reaction to the book, although he said it was there were so many gaps that I couldn't wait to start filling in those gaps. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Was that That's something like the feeling you had? Uh, I don't recall having exactly that feeling. I had a feeling that here, here was a, um, here's a, something that gave you a feel of how a, uh, a feedback system could really behave intelligently. Uh, I guess I felt it was quite abstract, but not... You know, I would have used the word abstract rather than gaps. Here was sort of how it might work in principle, but how could you really make it work? Mm-hmm. I, I, maybe that's the same thing, that a similar thing. Um, I'm trying to see if i got anything in here on... on uh, these are probably the notes I made to myself while I was trying to write them write one of these manuscripts or revise one of these manuscripts. Mm, it's like uh, a discrimination net. Well, either a discrimination net or a... This is the problem of how much information is involved in opening a safe, oh. which I've used as illustration in various places. And probably worried about where does the information come from. Here's a little program to do it in some strange programming language that was probably invented for the, for the purpose. Uh, this is probably when we were trying to trying to formalize a number of the concepts for the first or the second paper, not the first paper that was in draft by now. Um, yeah, a graph theoretical model of problem solving. A note on epistemology. I don't know what that says. You'll have to read it if you want to at some <laughs> point. Um, Oh, this is sort of the question of how you could use artificial intelligence to do epistemology, which is something that's still on the burner and hasn't much been done. Uh, where's, here's a, this is probably notes in a conversation with Alan. Uh, this looks like our a notation. That the language here is a language from our first paper. little comment to myself on um, now by now we must have been at uh, at uh, yeah. Dartmouth because what is the relation of this to Minsky net and September we MIT. yeah this is probably uh, this is probably a uh, an outline for the talk although Al actually gave the talk I think this looks like a this is the way I outline a talk to Typically. And then it goes on and on. Here's the list of people who were at the at the uh, IEEE. Oh. And it's interesting that... Yeah, I wonder if there are any people who later... Oh, yeah. Everybody was there already. Ash- Ashby, John Bacchus, Julian Bigelow, Alex Bernstein of Chess Program fame, right. Peter Elias, who's later chairman of the EE department up there. Uh, Duda, who did uh, does work on pattern recognition, has a book, Duda and Somebody. Uh-huh. Uh, Fano was later head of Mac. Right. Um, Farley was an early pattern recognizing type. I don't know who Davies is. Galanter and Galanter. Uh, Eugene Galanter, who wrote uh, with Miller plans and the structure behavior. I don't know who Glashow is. Garcia Hagelberger was um, sort of a mathematical information theory type, I guess. Yeah, Bell Telephone Company. George Miller. 
you know. Leon Harmon at Bell Labs. Yes. John Holland of Michigan. Anatole Holt. Uh, he's now up in Boston freelancing, I believe. Duncan Luce. Donald McKay of England. John McCarthy. Warren McCullough was there. I'd forgotten that. Marvin, I don't know who Melzack is. Trench Moore was this guy Melzack. who... Yeah, uh, ZA, math department. Hmm. I don't know. John Nash, who was a very bright game theorist, who I think later had some mental troubles. Uh, Trench Moore was the guy who had done this other logic program. Alan Newell. Uh, Abraham Robinson. Let's see, that's the Toronto Robinson. Was he the... I can never keep the... He's the one who later went to Berkeley, isn't he? He's not the one... No. He didn't get into the theorem proofing. Matt Rochester. Hartley Rog Rogers, the, the uh, symbolic logician at Harvard. Walter Rosenblith, who's still at MIT, you know who he is. No, uh, no. Wiener Rosenblith. He, oh, he's that one. That yeah. Uh, Jerry Rothstein, who's a strange, crazy man, uh, been around the electronics computer area for a long while. Dave Sarah, I've forgotten who he was, although I've known. I don't know who he is anymore. Uh, Lloyd Chapley, the mathematician, ran. Schutzenberger then was doing information theory kinds of things. He's a very good mathematician, an associate of Shannon, I think. Oliver, uh, Claude Shannon. Norm Shapiro was at RAN. I forget just what he did, but he was a computer type. Me, Ray Solomonoff, uh, Moore, the guy who did the automata theory, early automata theory stuff. I don't know who Webster is. John Kemeny. Uh, Steele, I don't know. So you see, a large part of the world was there already. That's very interesting. Yeah. 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 Oh, here's a... Well, you may not want to go on with this particular... Route. If you don't, if you'd rather go no, somewhere else, let's fine. do it. Uh, here, we, Ed and I must have been worrying about uh, letter features, and I was learning Hebrew at the time, so <laughs> I was, <laughs> well, you know, you got to keep busy. Uh, <laughs> I was contrasting the distinctive features in the Hebrew alphabet with those in English, in the Roman alphabet. Uh, I don't know why I was doing some automata theory there, but I was. These are probably notes on some reading of automata theory. No idea what that is. Looks like machine language something, which I was in detail trying to find out what happened in the program. Oh, I gave you one wrong fact last time. Probably gave you millions of wrong facts. Uh, clearly, I learned to program a 701 uh, in 1954 and not 52. Um, and it was just before, well, I started learning before we went out to Rand that summer. And I know I was working on it the day that Al and I started out for the Edwards Air Force Base, the trip I told you about. Right. Because the when we started from the Rand parking lot, our first conversation was about the the interpreter within the 701. Uh, this is this looks like this is a 701 program. I can tell that. It might have been done much later. See, anything else here reminds me of anything? These are no very great help because they're not even dated. Not much help for it. They may even date back to. These may even date back to 54 because they're, uh, they're clearly 701 kind of notation, which I was actually tracing through. No, that's a list. That's an early list, maybe. So that would be later. Don't know what it is. Don't have the slightest idea. Uh, notes for one of our papers of about that time. Describing the methods. These are the early. These are oddly enough. These are these notes are fall of '56, but these come out of the uh, essentially are the language of the uh, IEEE paper. I'd have to work through to find out why I was still using that language then. Still worrying about automatic programming. Um, ideas of how it might be done. I still haven't found that one page with all the words on it. It's some attempt to do formal theory about the... But notice, it keeps oscillating back and forth between the actual programs and the psychology. In fact, I notice when you, when you write a label problem solving, you've been qualified by saying comma human. Yeah. There's some more Hebrew alphabet. Uh, apparently, 
I would, had gotten, at this time, I'd gotten De Groot's Dutch book on, on uh, chess and was uh, translating pieces of it. From the Dutch? Yeah. And comparing it with some of Seltz's stuff, which I'd known previously. Now we're down in November, and this is an. I, this looks like a memo of uh, Al's. This is probably a comment on a draft of a manuscript. Uh, observation on the MIT conference discussion of concept. Oh, this is an earlier MIT conference. Uh, the w papers of which were all circulated in a mimeograph thing that, that we had. And, uh, that? that was a conference held, I think, in 51. <laughs> He'd like to know that. <laughs> <laughs> it was true, too. I was reading Wertheimer. Uh, this is more of a psychology reading to see what we might get from it. More references to psychology literature, some of which I probably looked up. This is probably in connection. Yeah, this is much. There's a mention of the Eleanor Gibson mm -hmm. article. So these might even be earlier memos. Uh, I don't know why, what I was counting, but I was counting something. Well, you do a search of literature. Um, do you just sit down with an index? Uh, Looking, looking for keywords. Um, is it associative? How does it go? Oh, searching for literature. Searching through literature. Oh, mm -hmm. more often than not, I, I guess, primarily use citations to other things. And the trick is to get the recent stuff, because citations only point backwards in time. Right. Uh, for that, you use a variety of things. Uh, um, I would be inclined to take a few standard journals and look at the last year of their issues and and just scan titles and abstracts. And then you can use something like psych abstracts, but I don't have enough sit slice for that. I find that it just drives me up the wall. Um, so I'm more likely to to um, uh, look at recent issues of journals till I get a, three or four good recent citations, and then I work back, and you almost never miss anything that way. During this meeting, say after the Dartmouth conference, the IEEE meeting, uh, Minsky said, he didn't know for a fact that there was any hard feelings, but there should have been because um, he and several other people and you and Al were all essentially sharing a platform and all essentially talking as if you knew what you were doing when in fact you and Al were the only ones who really had done anything and the rest of them were quite fuzzy. Well, the only hard feelings, I don't know whether hard feelings describes it, but tough negotiations didn't have to do with Marvin at all, who was always... Marvin is a very generous guy in this respect. I'm sure he has the same feelings all of us have about wanting to you know, be discover this and that. But he's really a very generous guy. And if he's, if he's as paranoid as the rest of us about it, he shows it less. But what did happen was that John McCarthy um, decided before the conference that uh, he was going to report on the Dartmouth conference. He was going to tell them about our work, etc. And we allowed us how that wasn't going to happen. And so poor Walter Rosenblitz, whose name you saw there, uh, who was supposed to chair the session, uh, walked around with us around the MIT campus. We strolled down the Mem Boulevard and so on, uh, negotiating this during the noon hour, I think, before either the day before or just before we were supposed to go on. And finally it was agreed that John McCarthy would get up and give a general speech uh, about what went on, and then Al would, would present our work in particular. So we were not feeling at all uh, good about John, and uh, I think on, along that dimension I've probably felt edgy about him ever since. Uh, but uh, it did not involve the others in the Dartmouth Conference at all. It was strictly a matter of John and Rosenblith uh, trying to be in the neutral corner, and we didn't think there was any neutral corner. Um, but we were perfectly satisfied with what happened. Uh, John got up and talked in generalities, and then we got up and, and said what we had to say. But for that audience, it didn't really matter anyway, because uh, it wasn't clear that you know, very many of them were quite ready to evaluate it then. 
At the same meeting, you know, uh, Chomsky gave one of the first public performances of his three theories of language. Oh, yes. Yeah, he got up, uh, I think we mentioned that in the history. Uh, probably didn't note it. Uh, and Edinger, do you know Tony Edinger? Was a discussant of Chomsky. So he did a typical Edinger job, you know, nothing was right and it all wasn't very important anyway. And it was so outrageous. And Chomsky was very young then and he looked helpless. You know, he, he's young and he still looks helpless, though we've learned, learned better, you know. Um, and so Al Newell was so outraged that he jumped out of his seat and up on the platform and gave an impromptu defense of Chomsky, <laughs> which was very eloquent. <laughs> yeah? Hmm. Maybe this is a good time to talk about um, where machine translation went, and if it went away from AI, and just what that whole stream was about. And maybe you can sort of give me a little history of that. Well, I can give you a little bit, although, again, I don't know it too well. And on this one, I'm from some things that came up when we were writing the book, I know that Al's history and mine are a little different on this. But I think we both agree that, uh, that um, artificial intelligence, excuse me, uh, artificial trans uh, machine translation came out of the computer community and had very little communication with linguistics. And the idea that somehow or other... Uh, it was sort of Chomsky and linguistics that gave it the stimulus or that it gave the stimulus to Chomsky is probably not true in either direction. Uh, probably both of them owe to the, to the uh, zeitgeist. But uh, Chomsky was never really interested in automatic translation insofar as he was ever involved in such projects. It was to fund his work on linguistics and the uh, automatic translators really didn't borrow very much from linguistics except sort of a superficial you know, the superficial ideas of what a grammar uh, looked like. So it was a strict artificial intelligence approach to most of it from the very beginning, uh, and also a strictly syntactical one. And most of the people involved? Well, I was never very close to it. Tony Ottinger was quite important in the early days, um, but uh, there were two or three groups working. I, you, you can get better information on that from other people. Uh, I guess um, uh, Hayes, um, you know, the former Rand Hayes. Pardon? The Hayes at Rand. Yeah, what's his name? Uh, you know, Dave Hayes. Dave Hayes, yeah. Uh, who's now at Buffalo, isn't he? Yeah, that sounds yeah. right. Uh, Dave can probably give you a good deal of that. Ottinger could, uh, if he will, and he'll give it to you straight. If he's not too embarrassed. <laughs> uh, It, it always lived in a fairly separate world of its own and never really at that stage picked up very many ideas from from the problem solving stuff mm -hmm. and I guess honestly we could say never contributed many because we weren't aspiring to natural language then. The first time I really got any urge to deal with natural language inputs was the year I was out of RAN when I started working on the heuristic compiler probably motivated by seeing the progress that uh, Bob Simmons was making. And he was operating in an information retrieval kind of mode rather than in a language translation mode. That is his approach to mm -hmm. things was that. So it was a fairly separate community. We watched it sort of at a distance with interest. It was interesting that some people were doing this. Um, they thought they were operating as though it were a fairly straight syntactic job, find the syntax, translate the vocabularies, get into the syntax of the other language. But it eventually came to naught. Well, it came to naught. Uh, first it came to naught sort of uh, scientifically because it turns out that that isn't a job you can do that way. Since that was the way they were trying to do it, <laughs> they didn't succeed. Um, and then it came to a kind of grinding halt fiscally because a report was written by John Pierce in a committee which said uh, that it might be a good scientific problem, but there wasn't any practical need for it. Oh, I think I remember that. Yeah, it just wasn't cost-effective, he said. Because you could get human translators. Yeah, that report is, uh, it's a published report. I'm sure I have a copy of it around here if you have occasion to, to look for it. So uh, most of the projects then were cut down to scale. But then it got revived uh, as people began to have ideas to do something about semantics 
but in it never got revived to the point, as far as I know, where it's had equivalent levels of funding. And it, by now, it's kind of merged into the general artificial intelligence movement because natural language processing, well, nobody really takes translation as the most interesting task. The most interesting tasks are understanding language for various other purposes other than translation. And almost all the progress that's been made on this rebirth has been made with semantics very much in the center of the stage. Um, do you remember Mortimer Taub? Yes. Well, I well, remember he wrote a, a letter once. That well, he, he also, also wrote, wrote a little book. book. Yeah. Called Computers and Common Sense. Right. Where he was taking all the artificial intelligence people to task. Yes. And uh, one of the things he complained bitterly about was the fact that machine translation was taking the syntactic approach instead of semantic. Who well, did he say that? I said a lot of other things yeah. too. Yeah. Well, good for him. I'm glad he was right about some things. <laughs> Yeah, no. uh, where, where is um, this sort of um, language study going on now? Like I think there's still a group at Texas. Uh, someone named Lehman down there, I think. L e h m a n. Don't know. I'd have to I mean, check up. Uh, I don't know whether Dave Hay. I don't think Dave Hayes really does translation. He's interested in language processing of various kinds. He'd probably be a good resource on this if you want to find out more. I just don't keep close tabs on it. There are always are rumors of somebody who has an actual working system that produces great translations. There's supposed to be one military system operating now. But I just hear these things and they go out of my ears and I don't, I don't follow them up. Do you think that the, um, the collapse of the machine translation project had anything to do with bringing AI into disrepute, because there are some people yeah. outside AI who feel that you know, what oh. you're doing is not very significant. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know whether the failure of the language translation project was cause or effect there or neither. Um, the idea of AI just evokes a great deal of affect in some hearts. Well, I think it's very threatening to the idea of man as a unique creature in this world. And uh, I, it's threatening for the same reason that Darwin is threatening and the same reason that, uh, well, I guess our Darwin is the, is the or Copernicus was threatening. Um, now, you're making man just a machine, and that's very threatening to lots of people. Um, if you ask me why, again, I, I can't answer. It's not threatening to me, but I can state as a matter of empirical fact that it's threatening to many people, and you know many people whom it's threatening. Now, given that as a starting point, then uh, such people are going to bang away at targets in sight. And what kind of targets? Well, here were all these language translation projects, uh, many of which started out with optimism, as one should start out in any scientific endeavor, uh, and then they weren't delivering quite what they had hoped for or promised. Um, but I don't think they were, I don't think they were in any sense their failures were in any sense the cause of this antagonism. There's some of the ammunition that can be used, just as people have used our 1957 predictions as ammunition. They happen to have been pretty good predictions. Uh, it takes a fair amount of explaining. You know, if they'd come out just that way, we wouldn't need to explain anything. Now to explain why they were fair predictions uh, takes some explaining, and it's very easy to, to uh, level a shot at them. Um, so... Yeah, if the language translation had gone, then there would have been one target less. I don't think that would have uh, diminished very much the antagonism, probably. See, the, well, t take the matter, or maybe I'm... Uh, now, all right, let me be defensive. Uh, take the matter of the, the very widespread belief that there are all sorts of people in the artificial intelligence field who make reckless claims. That's a, a large part of the criticism from outside. Uh, and the people they mean include Marvin, an excellent target, include me, much less Al, somehow we're supposed to be distinguished on this dimension. We are, if you w look at what we write separately. Uh, Al is more conscious in what he claims publicly than I am. Uh, and then you can mention some other people. But uh, if you go around and look in other sciences, which maybe aren't so threatening, people make claims all the time. Uh, look at the uh, canons of behavior in 
uh, in uh, astronomy today. Uh, you know, gold can go around and uh, uh, with the smallest scintilla, whatever the plural that is of evidence, uh, he can go around and uh, make a new kind of universe that expands or contracts or uh, you know, permanently in one state or another. And uh, co cosmologists go around doing this all the time. And they're regarded as good scientists in astronomy because that's part of the mores of that field. Uh, ditto for geologists plate theories of, uh, of the world. Um, these all go way ahead of the evidence. Uh, and uh, uh, in some fields, this gets institutionalized as acceptable. Biologists, on the whole, are much more careful uh, in that sense of careful. They tend to stick much closer to the, to the data in the kind of speculating they do. So if people from a field which does less speculating look at a field where uh, this is done, so to speak, and they say, oh, here are a bunch of publicity seekers, uh, and so on and so forth. Yeah, although I'm not sure, I, I think you put your finger on it when you say the, the animosity that people feel toward machines replacing human beings has a lot to do with it, because nobody really seems to care whether cosmologists make these great claims or not. You can be amused, yeah. you can not be amused, yeah, whatever. Right. But people really take personal yep. offense Yep. At Someone going around saying, "In ten years, this will happen." So, well, this is the reason why I don't believe that the that the difference here lies in the behavior of the people in the field. I think the difference lies in the field itself and the feelings that people outside it have about the field. But you are aware of this. Uh, oh yeah. Enormous. Oh, I certainly am. Uh, by the way, it, it even includes people who are not very far from the field. And occasionally, it includes people who are converted out of the field. I think Tony Ottinger is an example. I think Joe Weissenbaum is an example. I feel people have gotten religion uh, um, in different ways. They're quite different right. kinds. Hmm. You think Weissenbaum's been converted out of the field? He's yeah, he was happily writing Eliza a few years back. I didn't hear that talk that he gave that got people so upset at the last... Well, for two or three years now, certainly since the time I gave my... Compton lectures up at MIT, he's been sort of denouncing, denouncing everybody in sight. Uh, he wrote a letter to what was it, Scientific American or Science, or where was it? I don't know. A long letter that appeared a year or two ago that Steve Coles got so upset about. It was mostly directed against me that Steve Coles wrote a great letter in response. Um, is his point um, mainly that you're barking up the wrong scientific tree, or it's just wicked? That it's wicked. wicked. No, in, in Joe's case, it's wicked. In Tony's case, or, or Bar Hillel, it's uh, you know, the hopelessness of it. They are uh, it's a nasty remark. Well, I make nasty remarks all the time. Uh, you know, there are two guys who tried real hard, and the particular things they tried, it didn't go, which is always a good proof that it can't. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, Joe, I think, is a different case. I, don't, I think he got religion in connection with the troubles, the student troubles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, but I'm no depth psychologist. Well, controversy is very much a part of, of the gestalt of science, and one expects mm -hmm. to have to defend one's mm -hmm. hypotheses and so on. But there really does seem to me to be a, a higher degree of acrimony. Yeah, I think this would be comparable probably to what you'd encounter if you look back at the Darwinian controversies. It, it really, you know, it really gets people, really gets people where it hurts. Yeah, I, I know this from my own experience. When I tell people what I'm no. doing, I get some very interesting reaction. Uh, Leland Hazard sort of missed the point of my anecdote the other night at, at dinner about, about not getting served dinner when I, when I tried out the, the reproducing beast. But um, that, that was an example of the horror you can stir in people's hearts. By, uh, even speculating about such things. Well, I, I suppose eventually I will have to go and talk to Weisenbaum and certainly read what he's written. But um, maybe maybe I'm morally deficient. It doesn't seem wicked to me at all. Yeah. But I. But I, you can see why it could. Yeah, I do. For sure. I do. I do have a, you know, once once you sort of pass the bound where you don't believe it anymore, yeah, it's hard to empathize. Yeah. And say, well, yeah. it's, it's something very special. Um. 
lots of you may as well talk about that 1957 paper. Do you have a copy of it around, or maybe what I should do is bring in a copy? Which of do you mean by the 57 one? The, the the infamous one that everybody. Oh, the predictions. Yeah. Uh, I don't know whether I have a copy. I probably. Well, I'll tell you what, next, here, but next I, time we get together. I sort of remember that pretty oh, well. Oh, all right. Yeah. We talk about it. Um, some of the predictions and uh, why you... That explanation yeah. we were talking about. Well, um, let me give the setting out first. I was going to talk to an ORSA conference, which is in Pittsburgh here, uh, and I wanted to talk about our work, but I wanted to talk about it in a way that was relevant to operations researchers. And I thought a relevant way to talk about it was to try to do some assessment I say I on this, but almost all of these things are we. I actually gave the talk, but Al and I, of course, worked this thing out together. Um, that um, uh, to give an assessment of what the implications were, I, that was my intent, to give an assessment of what the implications were of this new paradigm, if you please, uh, for fields of management and management science. Uh, and so the, the way of doing this was to try to be concrete try to give some for instances, as it were, of the kinds of things you could expect to happen. Because you can talk about this in the abstract till the cows come home, and that's very hard for people to... Then you're expecting them to draw the implications, and I was trying to draw the implications. So I took four things that seemed to me to be plausible extrapolations of what was going on then. Uh, a chess playing program that would be world's champion. All of these to be happening in ten years, because well, I've done some social prediction before that and since. Uh, I, I guess I should add that to the premises. I, uh, this was not a new belief in making prophecies. Uh, I'm quite interested in the problem of how you make social predictions and of the importance of, under certain circumstances, trying to make them. And I've been engaged in a major effort of this sort earlier when I worked with the Cowles Commission and doing a report on uh, peacetime uses of atomic energy back in 1950. Um, so uh, I thought that, that it was important to do this for this field, and we predicted then, because chess was already underway, a chess playing program that would be world's champion in 10 years, a musical composition that would have serious aesthetic content in 10 years. The reason for predicting that one was that Hillier and, uh, uh, Hillier and, uh, Hiller and Isaacson had already uh, you know, produced the Iliac Suite, which was not trivial and uninteresting. Uh, so that was almost there. Uh, the third was that most psychological theories would be stated as computer programs, and uh, since we were going to do that, <laughs> that seemed a reasonable one to say. Uh, and the uh, fourth one, um, why am I blocking on the fourth one? Do you remember? No. Um, chess, music, psychological theories. It'll come back to me in a moment. But you see, each one of those arose out of work that was already that was already uh, uh, beginning. Uh, and 10 years seemed a reasonable time in terms of what we thought would be the effort applied to those. We made no prediction about natural language, in which we were far too conservative, because at that time that looked very far away uh, to me, and Al, I guess, too, and that moved you know, much faster than we expected. Uh, so at the end of the 10 years, we didn't have our chess champion, but we had chess playing programs. And there we just vastly underestimated two things. One, how little, I guess this was overestimated, how little man years would go into this. And secondly, uh, how much very specific knowledge had to get poured into it. Mm -hmm. Maybe we left out some other things, but those are the only things I'm willing to admit that we left out. Again, on the music thing, uh, we essentially, the, the prediction was correct. But even then, much less labor went into this than we expected would go into that. So the biggest mistake we made, actually, in the predictions uh, was an overestimate of how much this field was going to fascinate people and trap them into working in it. We just couldn't understand how any people could stay out of it. And they managed to stay out of it in droves. Why? There probably are more timid people in the world, even in science, than one likes to believe, who like to do things in well-structured environments where there already is a paradigm to work in. There probably are more normal scientists and less revolutionary scientists than one likes to believe. And um, you know, among even people I've had as students, there are people who wouldn't march up to things like this because they knew another kind of problem. They were well-structured and they knew at the end of, the, of a year they'd have a PhD thesis. What would they have with this wild stuff? So, 
uh, we probably just very much overestimated the number of people who are willing to work in unstructured spaces or relatively unstructured ones. Secondly, we underestimated the extent to which the computer science culture was going to be colored by the mathematics culture during the early years. And heuristics never appealed to mathematicians. There weren't any theorems in it. Whereas things like automata theory had theorems in it. And with things like uh, time sharing and programming developments, you could at least you know, define programming languages and the like. So I think we misestimated the culture that, out of which the scientists were being drawn and what they would be fascinated by. We misestimated the amount of adventuresomeness would be necessary to operate in this field. I don't think we seriously overestimated the difficulty of the problem. I uh, underestimated. Yeah, we did specifically on chess, but you know that was just really a for instance. Now, was that the question I was trying to answer? Yeah. I said I was going to be defensive, and I was. I must be blocking for some reason on what the fourth prediction was. Well, we can look it up and check. I thought I knew it was just like this because I'm frequently called on to when I give lectures. There are frequently questions about them. Well, of course, people like, uh, what's his face out in Berkeley? Um, Dreyfus. Dreyfus has taken on that. And just oh, he attends my lectures when I come out there. Oh, does he? Yeah, so I always manage to tell the anecdote of how the how McHack trimmed the pants off of him. Oh! And by now that gets him very upset. Oh, you know about that? No. Well, in the, in the there was I'm first this... Oh, I see. <laughs> uh, well, let me not I'm get you myself. off that, but... But, uh, you know, there was an underground version of his uh, book yeah, that circulated yeah. called Alchemy and Artificial Intelligence. It was a Rand paper. Um, oh, there's a long story behind this. I will only tell you a piece of it today. Um, and in that, there was some really, really nasty stuff about the chess because he was looking at our NSS chess program at Rand, and he knew that a 10-year-old child had beaten it and a couple of things like this. And so he really, you know, he really played that hard. Uh, later on, as this got to be known, the MacHack program was running, which of course was a very much stronger program, and uh, somehow or other he was induced to play it by, uh, what's the name, the guy who, whose program it is, you know, the other guy, MIT. Um, that's part of his education. And he played the program and it walloped him. And this game began to be circulated uh, around and finally it appeared in Sigart. And Dreyfus became very righteous at that point and wrote a letter to Sigart uh, saying, uh, you know, he was being, oh, I think the, the, uh, the Sigart thing had a quote on the top, a 10-year-old child can beat a com uh, the best computer chess program, Dreyfus, and then this game below it. <laughs> so uh, he wrote a very righteous letter to Sigart. And I wrote one in reply, which is published there, um, in which I, I quoted, I can again produce those for you, uh, I quoted his book in various respects. One of the things he was arguing in the book was not, or in the document that preceded the book, was not only that the chess program was going to play bad chess, but it was going to play mechanical, non-human chess. But if you look at this game, it's a wonderful chess game because it's a cliffhanger. It's two wood pushers, you know, fighting each other. And they have these momentary great bursts of insight in which they get a fiendish, you know, a fiendish plan to trap the other guy, usually two moves deep. And alternately, the guy almost falls into the trap, or he doesn't fall into the trap. And uh, Dreyfus was being beaten fairly badly, and then he found a move uh, which could have captured the opponent's queen. And the only way that the opponent could get out of this he couldn't get out of it against correct play, but the only way he could get out of this was to keep Dreyfus in check with his own queen until he could fork the queen and king and exchange them. And the program proceeded to do exactly that. And as soon as it had done that, Dreyfus's game fell to pieces, and then it checkmated him right in the middle of the board. So it was a, a typical game. You know, it wasn't mechanical at all. It was a typical game between human putzers with these great moments of drama and disaster uh, go on in such games. It was wonderful. wonderful. Oh. oh, what got into him? I mean, why did he take Well, there's a long say? history to that, but again, I, I think you'd have to know something about him. Um, Richard Bellman was on the staff at Rand in mathematics. 
and it's pretty important to Bellman, as it is to all of us, to invent the things that get invented. And his candidate for the new great paradigm was dynamic programming. And he's going to do a lot of things by dynamic programming, including probably artificial intelligence. A lot of evidence that he had this, that, that was part of his program. So he became fairly hostile to Al and me, not in an active way, but in kind of a silent way. Uh, for a while, he wouldn't speak to me when he passed me in the, wall, uh, in the halls of Rand, although we'd, on OR things, we'd worked not together before, but we'd known each other well. And we never had a quarrel about anything. He just sort of stopped speaking. Then he wrote that letter. He was the guy who objected to the 57 predictions. You know, he wrote a letter. I guess I, I have... We had a deathless phrase in it that I think was not in the published version, which said, uh, a prophet need not be without honorarium in his own time. <laughs> I think the editor scrapped that, for which I was always sorry. <laughs> so, uh, as of 57, our relations with Dreyfus were a little tense, although I wasn't angry well, at him. Dreyfus won in I mean, uh, with Bellman, were a little tense. I, I wasn't mad at Dick, but he, he apparently didn't want to talk to us very much. Dreyfus's brother worked for Bellman. He was a good ma mathematical analyst, Stuart Dreyfus. And... He didn't like the artificial intelligence stuff very much, and I don't know why, maybe because he talked to Bellman too much. Right I gave some talks up at MIT uh, a couple of years after that, about 1960, uh, a series that Martin Greenberger arranged. Uh, I gave a talk in the series. And the Dreyfus brothers were in the audience. I guess Hubert was by then a mem uh, member of the, fac of the philosophy faculty of MIT. And I gave the usual stuff. It was kind of an EPAM-ish. I uh, used EPAM as a paradigm for human reading, learning to read. And um, uh, the Dreyfus brothers were so exercised by that that they asked permission and received it, which was worse, uh, to insert uh, a uh, half a page of discussion into the volume. Uh, I guess there was, I guess they did carry discussion, but it was not discussion that took place at the meeting. It was an afterthought they had. And it was a, a, a nasty little diatribe about, uh, about this preposterous stuff that was being peddled, and we can, I, I've got that also, you can find it. Um, but just a paragraph. And I think the idea of climbing a tree to reach the moon was in it already. Then Stuart, the older brother, uh, managed to get uh, Hugh a consultantship out of Rand for a summer. And he went out to Rand and wrote that artificial intelligence volume, which then got peddled as a Rand report. He had had no connection with Rand before or since. He had no technical background for this at all. But the fact that he was a consultant at Rand immediately gave him credibility. And that's, I guess, of the whole story. Uh, I, I was going to say I don't mind being criticized. Of course I mind being criticized. But, you know, that's fair game, and I can, I can play it the way a politician would play it. But the one part of this whole story I resent was the Rand name getting attached to that garbage. Uh, it was really, really false pretenses. Yeah, that's the first thing I saw. Yeah. And it really surprised me because I didn't know it Yeah. But that's the history, and I think there really is a tie back to the Bellman incident, although I have no evidence of that. Anyway, uh, does Dreyfus do anything else? I mean, does he have... Smokes to pot. <laughs> yeah, Bellamy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, he's um, he's. Uh, is, is his mission in life to undo artificial I don't know. He's a humanist philosopher, mm -hmm. and I suppose he writes other humanist and existentialist kinds of things. Uh, I don't know how big a part of his life this is, but it it's been an important part, obviously. And again, I think I think there's a certain amount of affect. You know, I don't think he's just doing this as a careerist. I think he really believes and feels deeply that we are the enemy. Do you view it as uh, just the kind of criticism that any anybody with a new hypothesis is going to come across, or do you really think that he has an axe to grind and that it goes beyond? Well, I don't think he has an axe to grind uh, in, in that. You know, I, I think he's a philosopher, and the function of philosophers is to look very critically at things. I always think they'd rather have questions than answers anyway. And uh, I think he does this, and I think somehow or other emotionally this one hits him in, in the ribs and so he's his aim is to make sure that this terrible stuff is discredited 
Has he had much of an effect that you know of? Well, you know, it's, I go up and down on that. Um, there's this underlying sea of feelings, and he taps it. Uh, you know, these feelings of worry and hostility, and he taps in very effectively. I think he writes well, and, and uh, his rhetoric is not without its sting. Uh, it's the usual question, you know, do people make history or do great movements make history? Uh, great movements mediated through people, I guess, make history. And I would think that the financing, for example, of artificial intelligence, some people think it's very generous now, but I would think there would have been much more resources put into this uh, if uh, there wasn't this tone of, of uh, criticism continually leveled from outside. But whether any one critic really matters, I don't know. Uh, it's clear that this English physicist who suddenly became an expert, Lytle, uh, damaged the Edinburgh budget. There's no doubt about that. So I guess, yeah, it has an effect. Now, whether you counter it by silence or by counterattack is a more difficult question. I oscillate on that, too. I oh. usually use counterattacks just to, to prevent my, me from getting ulcers rather than because I think they have any effect. Yeah, I was going to say that that, that doesn't really seem to help. Although, uh, Joe heard Rogers speak in um, the spring, yeah, just this last spring, and said he'd really changed his tune. And that uh, what he was saying in to this group of computer scientists, mind you, was that yes, uh, artificial intelligence is the logical uh, culmination of two thousand years of Western philosophy. Oh, but now we've got to go someplace yeah. else. Oh, well, that's uh, yeah, that's quite different from well, in a way, different, but a very natural next step. Oh, yeah, because it's implicit in in the nature of his criticism of the word "go." He's always contrasting these mechanistic this is and that's with gestalt like uh, uh, holism. His, yes, right. Yeah. And, you know, to go from gestalt like holism to Eastern philosophy, in, oh, in my map of the world, that's, you know, there's o only a very narrow river between them, not an ocean. Mm -hmm. I see. So, you so I, that doesn't seem to me like a major change in direction. Oh, I see. Maybe there's more charity in his <laughs> tone. Oh, yeah, I had the feeling, reading Dreyfus, that if somebody could produce a computer, and I mean in the sense of a machine, box, I say yeah. a box, that could do all, all the things there in that room that many computer programs all around the country now can do, then he would have to eat a lot of his words. And that seemed to me to be a very trivial sort of objection. Yeah. If somehow everything was under the same skin, then all right, maybe yeah. he'd be willing to concede it. Perhaps a lot of the problem that people have with um, thinking machines is that our notions of thinking are very broad. That is, we include daydreaming and we include accounting yeah. procedures. And laymen do when they're talking about sure. thinking. And so when I tell people what I'm doing, they say, oh, you mean like, like a bill I get from horns? And I say, yeah. well, no. Yeah. And then when they finally do say that, I don't mean that, they say, well, do computers dream? I don't have an answer to that, Herb, do you? No, there's not a good answer. The whole question of how you want to represent consciousness is not very clear yet. I think Marvin's done a little thinking about that. I don't have... I really haven't thought it through. Okay, well, it's 2.30. Um, we will get back to some of the philosophical questions. This was a conversation with Herbert A. Simon at Carnegie Mellon on Wednesday, November 6, 1974.